season of Pentecost. It is good to be back with you after a restful two weeks, and a special thanks to Eric and the rest of the staff for all they did while I was away during my uh, staycation. I do have a few announcements this morning. First, we are approaching, beginning today, our uh, Family Promise ministry as we provide meals this week for Family Promise. Um, they are now currently sheltering in the annex for the order of the session. And, but this week we are providing the meals. So if you can help out, please call or text Martha Taberlay and let her know that you're willing to help. Feed My Sheep is also coming up in a couple of weeks. Um, Lori Lamb, who heads up Feed My Sheep, is asking for people to sign up by Thursday, August 20th, if you'd like to help make sack lunches. A bag containing all the supplies you will need to make um, sack lunches will be provided for you, and you can pick that up on, at the church on Sunday, August 23rd, returning it by the 25th, and then we serve the meal on Wednesday, the 26th. So if you would like to help out by either making sack lunches or helping to serve the meal, then please contact Lori Lamb. Lori's information can be found in the weekly messenger as well as Martha's. Living Waters for the World. And next Sunday we'll be presenting worship. And you may notice the paramount today is actually a tapestry from Guatemala. Our team who went to Guatemala to install a clean water system will be leading our worship next Sunday, sharing their stories and pictures of the trip to Guatemala. This will be an excellent worship experience, and I hope you will make every effort to tune in and hear their stories, because they are clearly indicative of who we are as a missional church. 
called to work beyond our walls and even the boundaries of our country to reach out to those in need. Living Waters for the World has provided clean water systems in a thousand places across the country for communities in need of clean, purified water. Let us now prepare ourselves to worship God. Join me in the call to worship. Grace and peace to you from the one who is, who was, and who is still to come, the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. This is our God, the one who loves us and who gave himself for us, who gathers us in this place and bids us seek his face. Let us worship God together.
Friends, in our time of confession, when we gather to praise God, we remember that we are people who have preferred our desires to God's. Accepting God's power to become new persons in Christ, let us confess our sin before God and one another, first corporately and then silently. Merciful God, we confess that we do not always understand your ways. We are easily discouraged when life takes unexpected turns and our carefully laid plans and dreams come to nothing. We confess that we are quick to give up when things get difficult and quick to question your presence and your power. Forgive us. Grant us patience to wait for your good timing. Open our eyes to recognize your leading in our lives, to listen for your gentle whisper when we least expect it. And then give us courage to step out in faith and obedience, trusting in your leading even when we cannot, cannot yet see the outcome. We praise you for your faithful love and pray that you would make us worthy to bear your name. Hear this prayer and hear us now as we offer our confession in the silence. Friends, God's love is greater than our understanding and our comprehension. That love is continually given to each and every one of us each day. Rejoice. God's forgiving love is poured out for you now and always. Amen. As we now listen for God's word and what will be revealed to us first, please pray with me. Illuminating spirit, pour out upon us wisdom and understanding that being taught by you in Holy Scripture, our hearts and minds may be open to receive all that leads to life and holiness. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Our psalm for today comes from Psalm 133. Please listen for the word of God. How very good and pleasant it is when kindred live together in unity. It is like the precious oil on the head, running down upon the beard on the beard of Aaron, running down over the collar of his robes. It is like the dew of Hermon, which falls on the mountains of Zion. For there the Lord ordained his blessing, life forevermore. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Good morning, good morning. Come on down, children. Come watch. Mr. Moose has been looking forward to this. It's been a long time since he's got to be with you. So he's, he's real happy to see you today. Okay, this morning, Mr. Moose wants me to tell you some of the Bible story about Joseph. This is a real old story in the Bible. It is so old that it's clear back in the very first book of the Bible, Genesis. Joseph had 11 brothers and at least one sister. That's a lot. And Joseph's 10 older brothers all thought he was a real problem, a nuisance, a pest. They were also jealous of him because they felt like uh, their father loved Joseph more than he loved any of the rest of them. And that made them unhappy. One of the things that their father had done was to give Joseph a real pretty coat when the rest of them had plain things to wear. Mr. Boos wants me to show you a picture of that. Here's a picture of Joseph in the center with that pretty coat on and his brothers with more plain clothes all around him. Well, one day the brothers got even angrier 
at Joseph than they usually were. And they decided they wanted to get rid of him. So what did they do? They took Joseph and they dropped him in a well, which was like a hole in the ground. Mr. Moose wants you to see a picture of that too. Oop, wrong picture. Here they are. You can see the brothers pulling the pretty coat off of Joseph and dropping them down in the hole. That's the well. Well, he had been down there a little bit when there were some people coming along that were going to Egypt. And the brothers decided to sell Joseph into slavery. What that meant was they were gonna get some money from these men that were going to Egypt for selling them Joseph. And these men were gonna take Joseph off to be a slave in Egypt. Oh, Mr. Moose wants me to tell you that no matter how much you're aggravated by your brothers or sisters, you should never drop them in a well and you should never sell them into slavery. Is that right, Mr. Moose? Okay. Well, all of this sounded pretty awful with what had happened to Joseph, but God was always with Joseph, even when he was sent to Egypt. So over a period of time in Egypt, Joseph did well, and he became a very important person and everybody looked up to Joseph as being a really smart and helpful person. Over a period of time, a famine came, which me meant there wasn't much food. And this was over the whole area, even back where Joseph's family came from. But Joseph's brothers had heard that there was food in Egypt so they made the long trip there to try to buy some money, um, to buy some food. And when they got there, they found Joseph, but they didn't recognize him. Now, in this picture, Joseph is the fancy looking guy in the chariot. He's all dressed up like an important Egyptian. And these are his brothers over here come to buy food. Well, you know how unhappy Joseph must have been with his brothers, that they had dropped him in a well and sold him into slavery. But this is the really good part of the story. Joseph forgave his brothers. Isn't that neat? He told his brothers that he thought that it was always part of God's plan for Joseph's life that he go to Egypt where he could provide food for lots of people and even provide food for his family. And this is a picture of Joseph with his brothers after he forgave them. When he forgave them, he was so filled with happiness and joy that he cried. He was crying tears of happiness. Now the message for you, Mr. Moose wants me to tell you about the message for you, is that there are times when you aren't treated well. And when that happens, you will feel hurt or angry. But instead of holding on to the hurt or anger, if you forgive the person who didn't treat you well, you may also feel much better and you may have happiness from forgiving them. Okay, Mr. Moose says it's time for a prayer. So bow your heads with us and repeat after me. 
Dear God, we know you feel filled Joseph with joy when he forgave his brothers. Help us also to forgive and be filled with your joy. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. All right. Tell Mr. Moose goodbye. 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 Bye. The Old Testament lesson this morning comes from the book of Genesis. It is, in a sense, a novella in literary terms. It's the longest single narrative in Genesis. It begins at chapter 37 and concludes with the end of Genesis at chapter 50. It's the story of Joseph, the son of Jacob, his rise to power in Egypt, and the lessons that it teaches. It's probably important to have a little recap before we get to today's scripture. Joseph, who was the obvious favorite son of Jacob, by his jealous brothers is beaten and sold into slavery. Joseph, now enslaved to Potiphar, finds success and favor with his master. But Potiphar's wife tries to seduce him, and when Joseph refuses her advances, she falsely accuses him of seducing her and is thrown into jail. While in prison, Joseph, who long had been a dreamer, had learned to interpret dreams and he is once again held in great esteem by his jailers. Pharaoh hears of his gifts and calls for Joseph. He interprets Pharaoh's dream that there will be seven years of plenty and seven years of famine all over the land. Pharaoh then makes him the secretary of agriculture. And eventually Joseph becomes Pharaoh's second in command, handling all of the business of feeding people during the famine. The seven years of plenty have passed and now seven years of famine are on the land and the people. Jacob sends his sons to Egypt to buy grain. The brothers come before Joseph and they do not recognize their brother, but Joseph recognizes them and begins to exact his own form of justice on his brothers, throwing them in jail as spies, holding one brother hostage and demanding that they return with his youngest brother, Benjamin. Finally, Joseph gives them food and grain, but then sets up his youngest brother, Benjamin, by planting a silver cup in Benjamin's grain sack and accusing him of stealing. But his brother, Judah, filled with guilt and remorse, pleads with Joseph to let his brother go. Now Joseph's heart is opened, and we pick up the story as Joseph reveals himself to his brothers. This is Genesis chapter 45, verses 1 through 15. Listen now for God's word to you. Then Joseph could no longer control himself before all those who stood by him. And he cried out, send everyone away from me. So no one stayed, no one stayed with him. And Joseph made himself known to his brothers. And he wept so loudly that the Egyptians heard it and the household of Pharaoh heard it. Joseph said to his brothers, I am Joseph. Is my father still alive? But his brothers could not answer him. So dismayed were they at his presence. Then Joseph said to his brothers, Come closer to me. And they came closer. He said, I am your brother Joseph, whom you sold into Egypt. And now do not be distressed or angry with yourselves because you sold me here. For God sent me before you to preserve life. For the famine has been in the land for these two years, and there are five more years <coughs> with which there will be neither plowing nor harvest. God sent me before you to preserve for you a remnant on earth, to keep alive for you many survivors. 
So it was not you who sent me here, but God. He has made me a father to Pharaoh and Lord of all of his house and ruler over all the land of Egypt. Hurry, go up to my father and say to him, Thus your son Joseph, God made me Lord of all Egypt, come down to me and do not delay. You shall settle in the land of Goshen, and you shall be near me, you and your children and your children's children, as well as your flocks, your herds, and all that you have. I will provide for you there, since there are five more years of famine to come, so that you and your household and all that you have will not come to poverty. And now your eyes and the eyes of my brother Benjamin, I see that it is my own mouth that speaks to you. You must tell my father how greatly honored I am in Egypt and all that you have seen. Hurry and bring my father down here. Then he fell upon his brother Benjamin's neck and wept, while Benjamin wept on his neck. And he kissed all of his brothers and wept upon them. And after that, his brothers talked with him. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Pray with me. Gracious and loving God, we give you thanks for your word and the power of that word in the midst of our lives. We thank you, O oh God, for your unbelievable grace and love as we seek to be faithful to your call. And now, O oh God, may the words of my mouth and the meditations of all of our hearts gathered together be acceptable in your sight, O oh Lord, our rock and our redeemer. In Jesus' name, amen. Some years ago, a small Lutheran church in South Dakota was vandalized terribly. They went in through the church in the sanctuary, breaking windows, smashing light fixtures, flipping over a baptismal font, slashing a large painting that was given by the founders, scribbling and carving obscenities into the sanctuary walls. The golden cross that stood in the center of that sanctuary was used like a bat to gouge pews and to break things apart in the sanctuary. Downstairs, the kitchen dishes were broken and everything was trashed. The vandals cost more than $45,000 worth of damage to the interior of the church's building. Services were held outdoors the following Sunday and everyone was devastated and shocked, wondering how could someone do this to a church? Three months after the vandalism took place, the police arrested two area teenagers, a 19-year-old and a 16-year-old. The two boys, out of jail on bond, returned to the church to apologize on a Sunday morning. As the 19-year-old finished his apology and he walked down from the lectern in the sanctuary, the president of the congregation rose and went to him and embraced him. Members followed, shaking his hands in the hands of his friend who had caused so much damage. The people had every right to exact whatever justice they wanted out of those boys. They could have heaped on the guilt, saying the things that they destroyed were irreplaceable. They could have cried out for a harsh punishment for their terrible deeds. But instead, they offered the kind of justice that only God can give. Grace, and in turn, forgiveness. Joseph, for all his trials and struggles, finds himself in a place of great power. Not only political power, but now the power over the ones who callously and maliciously sold him into slavery so many years before. 
Standing face to face with them, he looked upon them. It's kind of like that feeling when you're face to face with someone who's hurt you and they know they've hurt you and you can see that fear in their eyes. It is that place when we find ourselves in a position of knowing the truth and knowing exactly what we could do to use it for retribution, for our own form of justice, for our own justification. The truth is, at first, Joseph took advantage of that position to make his brothers suffer for what they had done to him. He had the power and the means to hurt them, and hurt them he did. Falsely accusing them of being spies, he threw his brothers into prison, then held one of the brothers hostage as they brought back the youngest son to him, all for the purpose of Joseph's own payback. He was holding on to his bitterness, his anger, and he was set for revenge. He was having a hard time letting it go. In his book, Lee, The Last Years, Charles Flood reports that after the Civil War, Robert E. Lee visited a Kentucky woman who took him to the remains of a grand old tree in the front of her house. There she cried bitterly and showed Lee how its trunk had been burned and damaged by the Federals' artillery fire. She looked to Lee for a word of condemnation of the North, or at least sympathizing with her loss. And after a brief silence, Lee said to her, Cut it down, madam, and forget it. It is better to forgive the injustices of the past than to allow them to remain and let bitterness take root and poison the rest of your life. The story from Robert E. Lee reflects back to Joseph, who would have been justified in the eyes of the law for taking down his brothers. But there was something deeper at work in him even as he tried to exact revenge, it would not satisfy his soul. It could not heal his wounds. But to forgive, that would bring life. Something within Joseph knows that what he's doing is wrong. Something rises within him, something akin to grace. And he cuts down his own bitterness as he reveals himself to his brothers. The ones who clearly sold him out. The ones who deserved to suffer for what they had done. And he embraces them, provides for them, and promises to take care of them. The story of Joseph is an essay in God's justice lived out in the lives of the faithful. The grace that Joseph showed lived on through his life. At the end of the book of Genesis, Joseph's brothers still fear that now that their father Jacob has died, that Joseph will be free to exact the long-awaited revenge. Genesis 50 tells the story. So they approached Joseph, saying, Your father gave this instruction before he died. Say to Joseph, I beg you, forgive the crime of your brothers and the wrong they did in harming you. Now, therefore, please forgive the crime of the servants of God of your father. Joseph wept when they spoke to him. Then his brothers also wept and fell down before him. And he said, we are here as your slaves. But Joseph said to them, do not be afraid. Am I in the place of God? Even you, even though you intended to do harm to me, God intended it for good in order to preserve a numerous people as he is doing today. So have no fear. I myself will provide for you and your little ones. In this way, he reassured them, speaking kindly to them. 
grace prevails. Joseph did not forgive his brothers to please his father. He did not do it because it was his first thought. He did it out of his love for God and his desire to receive the fullness of God's grace. There was no latent grudge. There was no long-awaited retribution. Just a deep forgiveness. He let go of his need for retribution and opened himself to God's grace and extended that grace to his brothers. It begs the question for us, what are we holding on to in our lives? What is it that has deep roots of bitterness that poison our hearts? Now we may act on our desire for retribution, but we all know it brings little satisfaction. And we may wallow in the guilt of something we may have done or left undone, but all these things do is poison our souls. In a forgiving God in an unforgiving world, Ron Lee Davis retells the story of a priest in the Philippines, a much loved man of God who carried the burden of a secret sin that he had committed many years ago. He had repented, but still had no peace and no sense of God's forgiveness. In his parish was a woman who deeply loved God and who claimed to have visions in which she spoke with Christ and he with her. The priest, however, was skeptical and to test her, he said, the next time you speak with Christ, I want you to ask him what sin your priest committed while he was in seminary. The woman agreed. A few days later, the priest asked, well, did Christ visit you in your dreams? Yes, he did, she replied. And did you ask him what sin I committed in seminary? Yes, she said. Well, what did he say? She said, he said, I don't remember. This is the nature of God's grace. When we, by faith, turn our hearts to the living God, our sin is forgotten. And we are offered grace upon grace. As Joseph said to his brothers, and through the grace of Jesus Christ, we hear these same words, I have forgotten your sin. What better way is there for God to say, I love you? For God's grace is sufficient for us all. No matter what we may be holding on to in our lives, no matter if we are consumed by guilt, God extends to us healing grace. All we have to do by faith is accept it and live it and extend it to others around us. The story of Joseph is a marvelous story of reconciliation, a story of redemption, and a story of forgiveness a story we all need to hear every day. May God's grace be enough for us. Thanks be to God. Amen.
Friends, as we come to God in prayer this morning, it is right for us to share the joys and concerns of this community and at the community at large. First, uh, continue to pray for Ed Billick, uh, who has returned to Terra Vista, his original care center, after being hospitalized. Uh, his family is very grateful for the prayers that you have been given and continue to pray for them in this time. Also continue to pray for Nan Knight as she recovers at home from surgery to fuse her spine and for her family, especially with Al, as he cares for her at this time. Also, please pray for Rena Taylor and her family. Rena's mom, Frances Bowker, uh, who was placed on hospice care at Creekside Terrace in Belton, died on Thursday morning. Uh, please pray for them in this difficult time. And also pray for Ken Taylor's oldest son and his daughter-in-law, who are recovering from COVID-19. So many prayers are certainly welcome in this difficult time for this family. Also continue to pray for Chris Bolt's a daughter-in-law, Renee, Renee's parents, especially her dad, David Freemeyer, who is recovering from COVID-19 at home, uh, cared for by his wife and daughter, and he is improving. Uh, the family does appreciate our prayers, so continue to pray for them in this time. Also continue to pray for all those affected by Hurricanes Hannah and SES, and pray that everyone is getting what they needed from the devastation, being able to recover from all that's happened. Also continue to pray for Greg Mays and his parents, Cliff and Diana, as he continues to face health problems. Also continue to pray for those placed on hospice care, for Stacey Esplin, Bonnie Martin Bowles, Helen Mann, Dean Osmond, and Cindy Engel. And also continue to pray for those living with cancer, Frank Seaman, Tom Dunlap, Nancy Martin, Mary Gold, and Margot Beerworth Wyatt. I also continue to pray for all who have been affected by the massive explosion in Beirut, those who have lost loved ones uh, in Beirut, Lebanon, um, as they do try to put their lives back together and their city back on track. And also continue to pray for our Living Waters partners in Guatemala and Nicaragua, as they're doing great work there uh, for a community uh, that they are offering help for, for providing needs as far as clean water and the much needed, uh, much needed necessities for them. And for our mission partners, Paul Both and, in Sudan and Sharon Bryant in Thailand. And continue to pray for all those who have been greatly affected by COVID-19 for everyone who has fallen ill, for everyone who is trying to care for those who are ill, uh, for those who have lost loved ones, especially for those who are continuing to work in this pandemic, uh, the healthcare professionals, first responders, and those making deliveries and those in the military. Pray for all those in this time. And continue to pray for justice in this country, that equality will come for all, for those who are working towards that goal and that we make necessary changes for that to happen. And now friends, let us come to God in prayer for this community and the world. Pray with me. God of mercy and of grace, you have spoken in voices loud and voices small. We, at times, have spoken back, sometimes questioning your faithfulness to us, resisting your call for our lives, and yet our questioning never deters your presence in leading, love and mercy in our lives. Listen now, O oh God, we pray, not to the strength of our demands or doubts, but to the passion of our longings and the yearnings of our hearts. God of wisdom and of grace, by the spirit of Christ, your word echoes in this people and your presence in our lives. So listen now, not to the logic of our cases argued, but to the conviction of our belief that you hear us and respond. Move among us, O oh God, that in these days when it is not always easy to be the church, we might be your faithful people. As your people, keep us dreaming. 
We want to be a voice for truth, a place of justice, a balm of healing, a sanctuary of mercy, a people of nurture where children are seen as signs of your kingdom, where noble ideals are fostered in the days of youth, where faithfulness is encouraged among adults, and where wisdom of long years is cherished. We recognize around the world in the pictures we see peoples, people whose lives are shattered by violence and people whose lives are wracked with pain and illness. But also we see signs of peace and plenty and healing. Restore this good earth to a place of respect and peace, reconciliation and justice among all people. We find on all sides of the road we travel we find on all sides of the roads we travel, people who are afraid, people who are angry, people who are searching, but also we see signs of goodwill and hope. Restore this nation to a place of equality, of opportunity, of cooperation. Be with us, comforting God, and give hope to those we have named this morning. Ed, Nan, Rena, Francis, Chris, Renee, David, all affected by Hurricane Hannah and Isaias, Ken, Greg, Cliff, Diana, Stacy, Francis, Bonnie, Helen, Dean, Cindy, Frank, Tom, Nancy, Mary, Margo, Paul, Sharon, all affected by COVID-19, all who strive for equality. And now, silently, those we name in our hearts before you now. God of mercy and compassion, we pray this day where there is illness, bring wholeness. Where there is grief, bring comfort. Where there is loneliness, bring companionship. Where there is weariness, bring rest. Where there is anxiety, bring calm. Where there is regret, bring forgiveness. Where there is hunger, bring sustenance. Where there is oppression, bring freedom. Where there is homelessness, bring shelter. Where, where there is estrangement, bring reconciliation. Where there is new life, bring joy. And to all of us, bring a good and right and true spirit of thankfulness. And God of power and might, let us not make this prayer without asking that you give us grace and courage to be answers to the prayers we make. Hear us now as we, we pray in the name of the one who taught his disciples saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not to temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen.
team from Guatemala will be sharing in worship. So please make a point of tuning in. So go in peace. And may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God that will never let you go, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with each of us, now and forevermore. Amen. By the grace of God in Christ Jesus, the Spirit is upon us to magnify the name of the Lord, to make Him disciples, to meet the need of the least of these. So go in peace, go in joy, go in the Spirit of the Lord.